First of all, thank you guys very much for the invitation. It's a huge honor to be here, and this is a great uh, event. So can we just straight off the top give Drew and Hillary and everybody that's helped them a huge round of applause. <laughs> really awesome. So I have one pitch that I want to make today, which is basically that we need to be doing more causal inference in big data sets. Okay? And the reason why I believe this is the case is that although prediction is good uh, if the world doesn't change, if you plan to intervene in the world with a marketing strategy or a change in public policy, and you want to know what's going to happen after you intervene, you have to understand how things are causally related to one another. Okay? And what I'm going to talk specifically about is influence in networks. So I study networks, and I study peer-to-peer -peer influence in networks, and I try to focus on causal inference in these networks. So um, two years ago at F8, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was asked, what's the next big thing? And he said, well, if I had to guess, I think it's going to be social commerce. Okay? And Wired had a UK news uh, cover story of the, of the UK Wired, which was, commerce gets social how your networks are driving what you buy, which is a very causal statement. It implies that as your friends purchase products, they're going to influence you to be interested in and purchase those products. And lots of companies are trying to get at this process uh, currently. Companies like Cloud are putting influence scores on people, and there are lots of other companies that are trying to, to play uh, in this space. It also has a lot to do with the discourse, the recent discourse on the role of social media in the Arab Spring and other types of political mobilization and movements around the world. The argument here is that if you get a Facebook message from a friend that says, hey, let's go out into the square and protest, that that will change your behavior and increase the likelihood of protests and that they will spread from person to person and country to country. All of this is based on causal argumentation. Not that just because you're friends, you're both likely to go out into the square, but if I send you a message, I will get you out into the square to protest. So I was thinking about how can I drive this point home about influence in social media networks? Who can I pin this on? And the first person that came to my mind was Ashton Kutcher, because I thought to myself, yeah, this guy is like the poster boy for influence in social media networks. He took out big billboards uh, in LA on the 405 that said, follow A plus K on Twitter, right? And he was trying to become very influential. So I looked for a picture of him on the web, and I found this one. And when I found it, I realized that he's actually the poster boy for influence in social media networks, because this is a poster like you would find in your office building, like leadership with a picture of a bald eagle or whatever it is. And so here's Ashton Kutcher, and it says, influence. Behind every great man is 3,900,000 dot, dot, dot followers. Okay, now he has many more followers than that. But this has a very particular statement to make, which is that influence is about how many followers you have. Okay, so with a show of hands, let me see everybody who knows who Ashton Kutcher is. Maybe you follow him on Twitter. Okay, that's pretty much everyone in the room. So hands down. And with another show of hands, show me anybody who's ever done anything that Ashton Kutcher has asked you to do. <laughs> one person. There's always one person. <laughs> so. Uh, that begs the question, what is influence? He has a big microphone, but is he influencing people to change their behavior? And that is sort of the question that I go after. So I proposed a different definition of social influence a couple of years ago. It's how the behaviors of one's peers change the likelihood that or extent to which one engages in a behavior. And this is about behavior change, which requires a counterfactual. What is your prior probability of doing that behavior before receiving a message from Ashton Kutcher? And what is the difference between these two things? So I have this cartoon on my door in my office, and it's two friends talking. And one friend says to the other, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. And the friend says, it sounds like the class helped. And the guy goes, well, maybe. <laughs> And yeah, that's the point. Maybe he has an interest in statistics and a proclivity to understand statistics, and so he selects into the statistics class. And yeah, the average number of people in that class who understand this difference is higher than the population, but is the class teaching them that, 
or are they selecting in with a prior knowledge of statistics? And that is the point of causal inference. In network science, this goes under the rubric, although it's not exactly accurate, of the reflection problem, which is that we know now that human behaviors tend to cluster in network space and in time, but is this because of peer influence or alternative explanations? And let me give you an example. The best alternative explanation example I can give you is homophily which means birds of a feather flock together. We know that we choose friends who are like ourselves, which creates correlations in our preferences and our behaviors in networks. And when we see these correlations, we ask, is this because one friend is influencing the other, or is this just because their preferences are correlated because of homophily? And a lot of people say to me, you know, Sinan, I don't know, homophily, this sounds like a really academic term. Is this really a real world phenomenon? And I'd really love it if you guys would just stand up for a second. Uh, you know, I sort of feel like, you know, anybody who really, <laughs> thank you, anybody who doubts whether homophily is a real sociological behavior needs to co consult their local reality specialist because it's everywhere, right? We tend to choose friends who are like ourselves. And so if you're the chief marketing officer of a company, I gave you a huge data set and I said, look, all of the purchases of products are correlated amongst people who are connected on the Facebook network or on any social network. Uh, what can we do with this? And I said, well, in one scenario, I tell you that 90% of that correlation is because of influence, and only 10% of it is because of homophily. And in, a, in an alternative reality, I tell you, well, 90% is due to homophily, and only 10% is due to influence. You would have a very different marketing strategy. In the first case, you might adopt peer-to-peer -peer methods, where you give people incentives to convince their friends to come to the product or join them on the product. And in the second case, you would just segment the market based on observable preference and demog demographic characteristics. And and yes, those things would be correlated in the network, but it's not that they are driving one another to buy the products, it's that the correlation in their purchasing patterns is due to the similarity in their preference characteristics, which you can observe. So Max Weber has this very nice quote, which says, if you see a crowd of people all put up their umbrellas at the same time, you don't assume that social influence is responsible. It's probably a passing shower that is generating the, the behavior. So there are correlated external stimuli. Right? And that is correlated amongst friends. Why? Well, we tend to make friends at work. If work offers a discount to go to the gym to lower their healthcare costs, we all have a correlated exposure to that uh, stimulus. We tend to make friends with people in our local neighborhoods. If a new restaurant op opens up that serves fatty food, we all have a correlated exposure to that external stimulus. And since we have the same preferences because of homophily, we watch the same TV shows, we go to the same websites, and we see the same advertising. Advertisements. These advertisements could be creating the correlations in our behavior, just like the rain would create correlations in the opening of umbrellas in a field. So let me show you some studies that we've done that try to get at causal inference in relatively large big, uh, data sets, although you know, big is a, is a term of art. So this one was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2009. I call it the Yahoo study. We took a global instant messenger network from Yahoo of 27 million users and daily traffic in that network. We combined it with detailed demographic and geographic data about those users and about 90 billion page views about their online behavior. What types of content were they observing online? And we combine that with the day-by-day -day adoption and usage of a mobile service application called Yahoo Go, which eventually had about half a million adopters. And there's the adoption curve uh, over time. And the question we wanted to know is, well, there are these correlations in people's adoption of this product. Can we tease out influence on one hand from homophily and all these other confounding factors on the other hand? And what we did was we tried to extend Donald Rubin's uh, propensity score matching match sample estimation into a dynamic network network context. And so we call this dynamic, net, dynamic match sample estimation. And we describe this method uh, in the paper. And here's what we found. If we built sort of a naive logistic regression about the likelihood of adopting a product conditional on having a friend or friends who adopted the product, you'd get this kind of influence curve. And those are days since launch at the bottom and influence uh, on the y-axis. And that first dot on the 20th day says that Around this time, 20 days after the launch of the product, if you have a friend or friends who adopted the product, you are 16 times more likely to adopt the product yourself. And that's what the curve looks like. When we do the match sample estimation, these are the estimates that we get. 
right? And what that says is that a lot of what you thought was influence is just observable homophily, preference similarity uh, between friends that we can observe in their browsing behavior, their demographics, et cetera. And so if you were a chief marketing officer and you were given the black line from your data science team, you'd say, wow, what I want is I want a peer-to-peer -peer strategy early on, and then later on in the product lifecycle, I just want to segment the market based on observable characteristics because there's lots of influence in the beginning and less influence uh, at the end between different types of uh, people. And if you were to adopt that strategy, you would be wrong, right? Because it's actually relatively constant throughout the product lifecycle, the influence that's creating additional adoptions of the product. And the question we had was, well, why? What explains this huge gap when you control for homophily? And what I, the answer is what I term the iPad effect. And what we find is that essentially there's exaggerated homophily amongst early adopters. This is the cosine similarity of the browsing behavior of adopters to their adopter friends in hollow circles, non-adopter friends in the solid squares, and to a random user in the diamonds. And you see that they're much more similar if they're people who adopt the product early and when you look six months down the line, they look just like their non-adopter friends, okay? And the reason I call this the iPad effect is that people who are waiting in line to get the new iPhone are much more like their friends who are waiting in line with them to get the iPhone than their other friends who are waiting six months until the iPhone comes out. And therefore, there's exaggerated homophily. Now, that is an observational causal inference study, and it has some problems. Uh, Anybody know Dean Eccles, who's a data scientist at Facebook? The ch second chapter of his dissertation uh, at Stanford, his PhD dissertation, shows that high dimensional propensity score matching can reduce the error or the bias in estimates of influence by up to 80% if you have a lot of good data in the first stage of the model, but can be as bad as a 5% reduction if you have bad data in the first stage of the model. The real problem is unobservables. You can't observe all the things that are uh, making people do what they do, and so really Really, the gold standard of causal inference is randomization, randomized experimentation. Why? Because the control group and the experimental group are the same on all dimensions in expectation, even those things that you can't observe. So we did a study on Facebook, uh, which was about viral design. And we asked the question, can you engineer products so they're more likely to be virally shared? Um, and so we had an application. It was a movie app. And as people adopted it, we uh, divided them into control and experimental group users. Uh, and then we randomly enabled viral messaging for the, the experimental group users and turned it off for the control group users. And then we wanted to see, well, which features generate uh, more diffusion of the product from person to person in the network, and we observe the adoption and use of the application by friends of the control and experimental group users. We had about 10,000 experimental users. They had about 1.5 million friends, and we had detailed data on Facebook profiles, adoption data, and subsequent use of the application, and here's what we found. As you would expect, personal invitations, the ability to personally invite someone to data Gotham next year, are about three times more effective per message at getting that person to come to data Gotham. The passive awareness campaign, which is like the t-shirts that everyone's getting that says they went to data Gotham, are not as effective. About a 2% increase if you saw a t-shirt or saw a passive uh, uh, message that said Sinon is using this application. And the personal invitations nearly doubled the global diffusion of the product in the network but it was the passive awareness campaign that created even more adoption. Why? Because even though each message was less effective per message, there were many, many, many more messages and thus more exposure to the messages uh, in the passive awareness campaign. But it's even more complicated than that because personal invitations created a 17% increase in stickiness or people's uh, sustained use of the application, and that was because of network externalities. As I invited my friends to join joined me on the application, and we shared movie reviews and which movies to go to, I got more benefit from the application, and I was less likely to churn away from the application. The passive awareness campaign didn't create this effect because we were picking random people from the Facebook network, from my Facebook network, and if they joined, unless they were a good friend of mine, I didn't get this network externality from them.
And what this implies is a virtuous cycle between peer adoption and engagement. As I invite more friends to join me on the product, I'm more engaged with the product and I'm less likely to churn away from the product. As I'm more engaged, I invite more friends and then I'm more engaged and so on. And this probably has diminishing returns as I go down my best friend list until uh, people are less and less uh, interesting to me to share the application with. But this virtuous cycle has a lot of implications for marketing because it sort of has sustained sustained uh, ability to create returns from marketing dollars. Uh, but it's not just about marketing. We're applying the exact same science to promote HIV testing in South Africa by giving people incentives to invite their friends to take an HIV test and so on and so forth. They're making a movie about that. It's called The Social Cure, uh, which is about the use of technologies like Facebook to create positive social change. And you can follow it at The Social Cure. We did a second experiment, which was published in Science in July, about identifying influential and susceptible members of social networks. And what we did is we took those passive notification messages and we randomly blocked some of them. So only a randomly selected subset of neighbors receive the passive messages, which means that someone in my network, each person who receives a message is in expectation the same on all observable and unobservable characteristics as the person next to them in my network who didn't receive the message. And there's, this takes out my ability to select who I'm giving the message to, and it uh, breaks homophily and all of those things. It's explained uh, in the paper. This allows us to test randomized trials of someone's influence and someone's uh, susceptibility to influence. And this is what we found, or some of the results. Influence tends to increase with age around this particular movie application. Susceptibility tends to decrease with age. And women are less susceptible to influence than men. Um, <laughs> We also looked at dyadic characteristics. So influence transmits over relationship pairs of the same age more than if they're different. And it, there's suggestive evidence that older people influence younger people more than younger people influence older people. We also found, again, that women are less susceptible to influence than men when we, when we looked at the dyadic relationships. And influence tends to transmit over relationship pairs where the sender is of the same or greater level of relationship commitment as the recipient. So married people to single people, people in a relationship to single people, et cetera. Okay? And then what we were able to do is we were able to characterize the joint distributions of influence and susceptibility over the network. So what is the assortativity of influence in the network? What is the susceptibility, uh, assortativity of susceptibility in the network? Do influencers tend to cluster together? Do susceptibles tend to cluster together? And we found some really interesting results. That top panel shows your own influence mapped against your own susceptibility. It shows a trade-off. People who are highly influential are not likely to be susceptible. People who are high, uh, highly susceptible are not likely to be influential. There's also this debate about the influentials hypothesis. Malcolm Gladwell says influentials catalyze ideas and behaviors in society. And Duncan Watts says, no, it's actually the prevalence of susceptible people that creates these cascades in society. Our data, which is this one, show that there's the same distribution of peer susceptibility in the networks of people who are influential and those who are susceptible, which means that it's the joint distribution of influence and susceptibility in the network which creates these cascades cascades of behavior. Finally, if you look at this one, this is your influence mapped against your peer influence. You see a pocket of people who are greater than average in influence, who have friends who are greater than average in influence. These are potentially good seed nodes to target with advertising because they might have a greater social multiplier effect. But you have to counteract that with the notion that they're also likely to be less susceptible to influence. And so it becomes a complicated process that you really have to dive into. I'll give you one other uh, sort of result that we got from this study, which is about your susceptibility to influence as a function of your relationship status. So whether you're single, in a relationship, engaged, married, or label yourself as it's complicated, OK? <laughs> Single people are more susceptible to influence than people who do not report their relationship status. That's the holdout set. People who are in a relationship are even more susceptible to influence than people who are single. People who are engaged are even more susceptible to influence than people who are in a relationship. And if you're married, you're not susceptible to influence <laughs> at all, apparently. If you label yourself as it's complicated, you're the most susceptible to influence. <laughs> 
And I debate this with my colleagues, like, what is going on here? And I say, oh, yeah, it makes sense to me. As you get deeper and deeper into a relationship, you know, uh, you have more and more social commitments to the friends and family of your future spouse. So, for instance, the day before my wedding, if my future father-in-law invites me to an application, you better bet I'm going to accept <laughs> that, right? But my, my colleague Sanjeev Goyal uh, at Cambridge said, Sinan, you know, you don't really understand this process. It's like this. As two people get deeper and deeper into a relationship, they start to become one, and they start to make decisions jointly together. And he goes, let me put it to you this way. I don't do anything without asking my wife first. <laughs> So uh, let me give one plug to anybody who's interested in data science and networks. We have a conference here called the WIN Workshop, the Workshop on Information in Networks, that takes place 28th and 29th uh, of September here uh, at, uh, at Stern. And it would be, uh, registration is open. There's a website, www.winworkshop.net. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>